Hello, VCC friends, family. So good to be with you today and worship, gathering together digitally. Uh, we're gonna sing some songs to the Lord in a moment, but as we do every time we gather before we begin to endeavor in singing, I'd just like to start out with a call to worship to center our minds, our hearts, our souls, uh, more fully on Christ, who is good and wonderful and beautiful today. Our call to worship comes to us from Revelation 15, verses 3 through 4. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy, and all nations come and worship before you. Holy Spirit, move our hearts to sing of the worth of our King and of our God today. Pray this in your name. Amen. Family, let's sing together.
together as we begin to move into a time of worship through confession and assurance. Let's have this in our minds in this moment that we cannot come before God unless we first are honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In light of this, let us offer our prayers to God today. So as you have your heads bowed, I'd just like to read a prayer of confession over us. Holy and merciful God. In your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, family, let's all open our eyes today for our assurance, which comes to us from Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. He will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be cleansed from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Family, in light of the faithfulness and kindness of the Lord Christ King Jesus, let us continue to worship him for he is worthy today of glory and honor as he is faithful and good. Let's continue to sing. Okay. 
singing calling ourselves to remember the truth the beauty in you and now I pray Holy Spirit as we move forward in this time together as you open our ears to hear your word Let your word find its way 
into our souls to continue the work of transformation making us more like Jesus today is yours we love you and thank you for it pray these things in the name of Christ amen Family, friends, good day, welcome. It is good to be worshiping with you all. You know, the, the church um, is, should be a place where we can be honest and um, speak what's going on, and it's been a rough week. Uh, everywhere, all across this nation, things are, are happening at, at different levels of, of pain, but there, there's a lot of stuff a lot of stuff going on, and so I pray wherever you are uh, today um, that that God's grace would minister to your heart, uh, and you would know his love, and no matter where you've been or what you've done, uh, I pray that you would know that he has his arms wide open for you. So thank you for joining us today. Um, You know, something we say here a lot is that the church is family, and um, we, we believe that at, at the, the highest level to the lowest level, God has adopted us as his children, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and so um, I want to do a family moment here. So uh, at this time, I want to bring up some really good friends of ours. Um, so a uh, noble family, why don't you guys go ahead and come on up. Um, as they do, uh, I want to let you know this is uh, Dan and Karis and uh, Indy and Tilly and Posey. Come on up. (laughs) Uh, Well, um, many of you know the Noble family. I just want to introduce them real real quick and pray over them. Um, The Nobles will be uh, moving to Texas soon, um, and uh, they're awesome. (laughs) I knew I was going to do this. I just knew it. Um, Look, I even even have tissues up here because I knew this was going to happen. so uh, we've been friends for uh, a long time now. Um, you guys have been a part of this church longer than I've been here. I mean, you grew up here, and, and Dan, you've been a part of this church for a long time, and you guys, well, this is, this is your church family, and um, you guys have served in so many capacities. Um, Karis, you're up here often uh, leading us in worship. Um, man, Inklings wouldn't look the way it does without your design eye. Half the church wouldn't look the way it does without your um, eye for uh, design and aesthetics. Um, and you've served in so many capacities. And Dan, uh, as a deacon and with stretch and volunteering for everything, um, I just can't thank you guys enough. Um, <laughs> you guys are good friends. And uh, you know what, what makes saying goodbye so hard um, is, is that we love each other so much. Um, and so, uh, but I get the honor of praying over you and blessing you and commissioning you onto the, the new season of, of life that God has clearly been leading you to. And so in that we celebrate. We know God's hand is absolutely in this uh, long story, but God's hand is in this. He's leading you. And, and though there are tears, um, there, there's excitement um, and, and joy as well. And so um, on behalf of the congregation, I want to say thank you for everything you've done. Um, On behalf of me and Marla, thanks. Uh, You guys are awesome. I'm going to miss you a ton, but you'll hear from us, don't worry. Um, So with that said, um, it is good to be a part of a family, but it's hard to be a part of a family as well. So um, I want to pray over you and ask that God would bless you on your journey. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for the noble family. Uh, Father, you write beautiful stories. And I thank you for the story that you've written for each one of them and for this church and how those stories have woven together into a beautiful tapestry that shows a portrait of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you would bless them as they step out in faith and follow you to uh, new territory, a new country even. I think it's a country, isn't it? Texas and all. Lord, I, uh, 
I, I know there's some hesitation on the move um, because it is a big change, uh, but you know exactly what you're leading them to. And you're a God of new beginnings. And somehow in making new beginnings, you write something even more beautiful than what once was. And so, Lord, it is with great confidence that we know you're leading them into something beautiful, something good, a place where they can radiate the love of Christ as they have done here. So, Lord, uh, be with them each and every step of this journey. And thank you again uh, for letting us uh, become friends, become family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I thank you for Indy, Tilly, and Posey. I thank you for um, the beauty of their curiosity and creativity and boldness and, and courage. And I pray that they would thrive in their new home and their new location, Lord. So please be with them. May your face shine upon them. We love you, Heavenly Father. You are a good God to us. Reveal your goodness to them in their travels. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. We love you. Air hug, right? <laughs> love you guys. Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> you know, being a part of a church family is 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 incredible. And um, you know, these these months, you know, the last six months has just been crazy. Um, but how many beautiful things have happened because the church steps up and cares for one another. So if you are not part of a church family and by God's grace you are watching this. I just want to let you know the beauty and, and the joy that comes in being a part of, of the family of God. And so I pray you got just even a little glimpse of that here through, through that moment. Um, with that said, I want to transition now into the preaching of God's word. And, I, and let me reframe my mind, if, if you don't mind, for a second. So, um, Heavenly Father... This is your holy word. This is the word of, of God. And would you help me to handle this rightfully by the power of your spirit that Jesus Christ would be glorified, that you would be seen in your scriptures. I, I ask that I would preach this in faith that your spirit would do a mighty work in the hearts of all of those who listen, that your purposes would be accomplished by the power of your spirit through the proclamation of your word and it's with great joy lord that i get to proclaim christ yet again from the book of daniel would you lead me would you guide me it is in your precious name jesus that i pray amen well wisdom is not just for the sage like hermit who lives up on some misty mountain and wisdom is not just for the Yoda-like guru living in some faraway, exotic place. We don't have to climb a mountain summit to find wisdom. We don't have to light speed to Dagobah to find some wizened master. Because it turns out that wisdom has come to us. And as we will see, wisdom is not so much a something to learn, but a someone to love and trust. Wisdom is not so much a something to learn, but a someone to love and to trust. And we all need wisdom. We're all feeling the need, the, the ache for, for wisdom now in these disorienting, dire, and, and disheartening days that we're experiencing. Wisdom, where are you? That is the cry underneath so many of our cries. How do we flourish? How do we live well? And personally, I can tell you I have been aching and calling out for, for wisdom and needing it in great measure. How do I lead well, lovingly, faithfully in these days that seem to conspire against the simple, beautiful pleasure of the church meeting together to worship our God? in a world where social media is used as a digital wedge and a hammer to divide and polarize. As a husband, as a father, as a son, as a friend, as, as a human being who's trying to navigate a health crisis, a social crisis, a physical threat in, in the form of lightning, fires, and smoke. And I, I need wisdom to know how to tell my seven-year-old son how to pack a to-go bag 
because the evacuation zone is looming close to our home. And he wisdom on how to respond to not only the lightning lit fires, but the protest fires and the relentless tragic loss that we are seeing over and over again on our nation's streets. Not to mention the spiritual crisis of discouragement, depression, anxiety, anger, drift, and apathy that we are all facing now some nine months into this cocktail of crazy that we call 2020. God, we need your wisdom. Now again, the text we come to today is so timely and has proven to minister to me throughout the preparation, so I pray that it helps you in the preaching of it. So today, Daniel chapter 2, it has so much to say about wisdom. In fact, you could call the drama of this chapter Wisdom Wars. For we see a competition, we see a contest take place between the wise men of Babylon and Daniel, between Yahweh and the gods of Babylon. So let's remember, uh, before we walk through the story of this, this famous chapter in the book of Daniel, um, that the book of Daniel is part narrative, it's, it's part wisdom literature, and it is part apocalyptic literature. And apocalyptic, that's uh, this nice big polysyllabic word, but we've seen that apocalyptic uh, means revealing, and apocalyptic literature is resistance literature. That means it pushes against all that's, that's broken. It resists all that's corrupt. It's resistance literature that provides a heavenly perspective as to what on earth is going on. And perspective is so important. The right perspective can absolutely change everything. As an illustration of this, maybe you've seen that image of the lion and her cub that has made its rounds online. You know which image I'm talking about? That, that horrific one where, where the lioness uh, is eating the head of her cub. Do you remember, have you seen that? Oh, wait, wait. Sorry, I got that wrong. She's actually not eating the head of her cub. That's right. She's tending to her cub. She's carrying her cub, protecting her cub. But the perspective, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? Perspective makes the difference between life and death. And sometimes, if we're honest, it feels a lot like we are being devoured. Devoured by God, maybe. But Daniel, Daniel tells us we are being tended to. We are being carried by our God. Well, Daniel and his friends At this point in the story, they are in exile. Babylon has become the dominant world power. Nebuchadnezzar has flexed his geopolitical and his military muscles. He has shown his might. He's conquered Jerusalem. He has exiled the Jews to Babylon. God's people are in a dire, disorienting, and disheartening situation. Their former life, it's gone up in smoke, and they need perspective They need help seeing what is what through all of the smoke and ash. Daniel chapter 2 will help us with the heavenly perspective in a major way. So let's read the narrative of the chapter. What we're going to do is we're going to read it scene by scene, portion by portion, opening it up as we go. Now, I'm going to do it a little bit differently today. I'm not going to have the scriptures up on the screen. I ask you to open up your Bible. So if you have an analog version, open up those pages to Daniel chapter 2. Uh, If you have um, the VCC app, there's a Bible there or whatever your Bible app is, open it up to Daniel chapter 2 and follow along because we're going to move through a lot of text today. So I ask you to join me in looking at the scripture as we do this. So you guys ready? Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 and on. Here we go. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep fled him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, now here, mind you, the language switches from Hebrew to its cousin language, Aramaic, all the way through till the end of chapter 7. 
to the language switches in, in, the original, in, the, in the original manuscript. It says this, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll show you the interpretation. Well, heavy is the head that wears the crown and anxious is the one who tries to conquer the whole world. Nebuchadnezzar's having dreams, troubling dreams. Something was up. He was up. Something was working on him. Slept, sleep uh, fled him. A message seems to be coming to him, but he, he doesn't know what in the world it is. And by the way, in Babylon, a, a bad dream wasn't just the outworking of a bad late night snack. A bad dream was a bad omen. The gods were telling you that something was going to happen. And as we find out, this dream was God, Yahweh working on the subconscious of this arrogant king. God was at work troubling this tyrant. By the way, just let that sink in for a moment. God uses a dream through an arrogant king to bring hope to his people and to tell us even today about his eternal kingdom. That'll mess with you. Now, I get ahead of myself. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar, he, he wants to understand these dreams, so he brings in his wise men. Pick up at verse five. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn. Literally, it says destroyed limb from limb and your houses be laid in ruins. Your family too, everyone wiped out. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. <laughs> well, they answered a second time and said, uh, let, let the king tell his servants the dream and then we'll show you the interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. In other words, he doesn't trust them. We see here some things about Nebuchadnezzar. This is, this is a short but powerful character study. He's troubled. He's a troubled man. He is anxious. He's suspicious. He's irrational. He's violent. He's cruel. And you got to give it to him. He's shrewd. He knows interpretations can be made up. He knows they've been schooled and how to try to figure stuff out and put forward their answers and make it sound just right. But what can't be made up is them knowing the dream itself. Proof of true wisdom, proof of, of them knowing the gods and being in communion with the gods would be found in knowing the dream and then telling the meaning of it. So we're, we're here at a problem. Verse 10, the Chaldeans answer the king the third time now, three times back and forth. And they said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. Unprecedented. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one, no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Now hold on to that. Because of this, the king was angry, very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So look, the, the wise men state the truth quite rationally. No one can tell the king what he wants to know. Only the gods, and the gods aren't down there with them, and, and so they can't do it. And then the king rages. He says, kill them all, and I can't help but to think of you know, Alice in Wonderland and the Queen of Hearts, you know, when she just shrieks over and over again, off with their heads, off with their heads. Here it is, off, off with their heads. And so 
we have an impossible problem. What the king asks for cannot be done by the wise men. It's above their pay grade. Their wisdom taps out. It hits its ceiling. Death is on the way. And we have a major problem because Daniel and his friends are under the same death penalty. So here in the narrative, the, the dramatic tension just rises to the roof. Verse 13. So the decree went out. Uh-oh, it's happening. And they were tracked in that. And the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion, with, with thoughtfulness and tact. To Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, or in the Aramaic, chief butcher, brutal assassin. So he talks to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Daniel declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So Daniel hears, and with wisdom, with with thoughtfulness and with, with tact, again, with prudence and discretion, as it says there in the text, he asks for a bit of time. Now, keep in mind, he is talking to the guy who is called the chief butcher who is sent to dismember Daniel. And Daniel talks to him in a way that actually buys him some time. And then Daniel does the next step. He makes an appointment with the violent king so he can then give him an interpretation. Uh, okay, wait. Does Daniel have an interpretation? Not yet, but he says he's gonna give it to him. All right, this, this is brave. This, this is faith. Daniel is, is not just courageous. This is confidence that God will provide. Talk about being a non-anxious presence. Confidence in the character of God makes one courageous. This courageous Daniel, what does he do next? Verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So catch this, Daniel goes home, he gathers his friends, and he prays. Now he's gonna pray, but he's drawing others in with him. He's drawing others to pray. He's drawing others in to trust God. He takes the problem into God's presence. This is primary for him. He takes the problem into God's presence. And Daniel knows his Bible. He prays his Bible. He knows Exodus 34. He knows that one of the primary characteristics of who God is is his compassion, is his mercy. So he says, Lord, have mercy on us. He also knows Genesis 37 through 50. He knows the story of Joseph. He knows the story of the Pharaoh. He knows that God provided wisdom so that Joseph could interpret for the Pharaoh and it turned out to save many. He knows these stories so he prays for the same mercy to come his way. He knows God can do this. He's done it before. He knows that wisdom comes from God. Verse 19, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night parallel to the king who's troubled. Daniel gets the meaning, gets the dream and the meaning then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. See, God provides the solution to the seemingly impossible problem. Daniel is given the content and the interpretation of the dream. And here we come to uh, a prayer of praise written as poetry. And uh, by the way, uh, scripture help, a little aside here. Whenever you see an author moving through narrative and jumping to poetic form like this, um, it, it's basically a clue that says key ideas are being presented here. Pay attention, the form is shifting because I want you to see something. So, verse 20, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. 
He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. God has given Daniel wisdom. The God who is a source of all wisdom and power, the one who sets up kings and takes them off their thrones reveals the mystery to this young exile. The God of Daniel has bested the gods of Babylon. It's time to let Nebi know who the true king of power and wisdom is. Verse 24, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king. I will show the king the interpretation. I have it. I'm going to let him know. So here we go. Into the presence of the volatile, violent king. Verse 25. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No. No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Daniel, in his wisdom, gives credit. He lets it be known where wisdom comes from. God, I can't, he says, not a chance, but Yahweh can, and I will tell you what he has told me. Second half of verse 28, your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this, the things to come as history rolls on. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Now, come on, in case you missed it, Daniel punches it again. Wisdom comes from God. Wisdom is found there in trust in him. Now the dream and the meaning. The, the king has this dream. This, it's this crazy, bizarro dream of this four-part statue. Uh, the head is of gold, the arms and chest of silver, the abs and the thighs of bronze, the legs of iron and feet of a mixture of iron and clay. And there it stands powerful and and glorious and then the strangest thing happens this rock that's not carved from human hands comes flying from heaven and strikes the statue at its feet where it's iron and clay and the whole thing it just comes crumbling down the whole thing every part of it shattered then it gets even more weird Like, then the rock grows, like it's a plant or something. And it grows. It's almost like the rock is some kind of seed, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And this rock then becomes a mountain, and the mountain fills the whole earth. And Daniel says uh, that the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar and his empire. The other metals are the other kingdoms to come throughout time. And the strange, divine, humble rock that has crashed landed and shattered the statue of the earthly kingdoms 
This is the kingdom of God that will rule over all of the earth and that will last forever. Now, in a, in a couple weeks here, we're gonna carefully read through that whole passage and explore this dream at, at length. But for today, we need to see that Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar that this kingdom of God is going to crush the arrogant kingdoms of humanity. His kingdom will come in a humble yet divine, small way that, that, that then begins to grow and will overcome all of the glitter and the flexing of power of all the kingdoms of this world. This little heavenly rock will grow and a mountain will fill the earth. Uh, it's to represent the, the reign of God, every empire of man is temporary, derivative, fading, but God's kingdom, it's gonna stand forever. And Nebuchadnezzar is being called to see his place and that his power is, is given to him by God. Now pause, like that's, this is an uh-oh moment in the narrative because here's Daniel. What does this king already said he's gonna do? He's gonna dismember everyone because he's unhappy with them. Now Daniel comes in and says, by the way, your kingdom essentially is going to crumble. There is one that's going to last and it's not yours. Is this where we see Daniel dismembered? Verse 46 through 49. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. Ah, vindication. In a miracle, this feared high king, this tyrant who is, who's devouring nation after nation, he bows down before the exiled teenager Daniel who bears the wisdom of the God of gods. Now, I don't believe here Nebuchadnezzar is converted to worshiping Yahweh. There's plenty of room in his polytheistic worldview to include one more, one more God. And in fact, we're gonna see that play out in the next couple chapters. So I know he's, he's not a faithful follower of Yahweh yet. But notice the pattern of Daniel that we've talked about. Exiles tested, the faithful persecuted, faithful vindicated, and Yahweh acknowledged. Daniel is vindicated after this death threat and now Yahweh is acknowledged. Because of this, Daniel is given a place of ruling over the whole province of Babylon. And uh, his life is V-shaped, so to speak, right? Plummet into exile and persecution, exalted to a high station, from death by dismemberment to exaltation in the king's favor. That is the narrative movement. Now, with that looming before us, with that, that narrative moving through our minds, um, I wanna offer some reflections on the way of of wisdom that we see in here. So first, first is this, um, wisdom is, is not so much something to be learned, but someone to be loved and trusted. Wisdom is, is not so much a, uh, a what to be learned, but a who to be trusted and then to follow his, his way. In other words, wisdom is found in and flows from a right relationship with God. And yes, wisdom is said to be skill in living, absolutely true, uh, but it's because um, we are living now in accordance with God, the one who has ordered and ordained all things and knows the way of flourishing. So again, wisdom is not simply learning some, some what, some life hack, but loving and trusting a who, the one who has created us. We see that in how Daniel acts. He, he throws himself at the feet of the Lord for wisdom. Second, wisdom engages others with thoughtfulness and tact. It's with prudence and discretion he talks to the one who's about to assassinate him. 
There's a sweetness to wisdom. There is a thoughtfulness to it that considers the other person, even if they are our enemy with weapons aimed at us. There is a thoughtfulness about who they are and how to love them and how to speak to them sweetly. The, the Aramaic word there uh, is, is actually, um, it has to do with savoring, that there is, there is a sweetness to the words. Not a bitterness, but a sweetness. Also here in the story, we see that wisdom bears a non-anxious presence and brings our problems to God's presence. Daniel puts things in the right order. First things first, prayer for him is primary. If God's not in this, Daniel's done. First things first, he goes to the Lord in prayer and because he trusts in this heavenly creator, he can be a non-anxious presence, not because he's talked himself into it, but because he's talked with his creator who can do anything. Also, we see that wisdom recognizes any power or authority that we have been given uh, is, is given to us from, from God. Any power we have, it doesn't come because we're, we're so smart, we're so um, talented. It, it comes from God, ultimately. And so in this, God is showing Nebuchadnezzar, where do you think your power and any wisdom that you might have at all, where do you think that comes from? You need to, you need to acknowledge reality. And this is, this is humbling, and this is, this is healthy for us. Whatever power, authority you have in whatever situation you are in, if, if you don't see that as derived from God, as a gift from God, I guarantee you, you will abuse that because you will feel entitled to it. You will feel better than other people. You will look down upon them, and there will be a power dynamic that will hurt and oppress the other when you don't realize power and authority given is by grace and not because you are a godlike figure. And then fifth here, uh, wisdom sees the big picture, that our story is set within a larger story. Daniel knows all these events that are going on sit within a larger arc of narrative. He knows God is doing something and then in the dream, God reveals a long timeline of history and that Nebuchadnezzar, who everyone thinks is, is the top of the game, is, is at his apex in the world, he's just a blip on the history line. He's just a blip. Wisdom sees a big picture that our story is set within a larger story. And this last point, this is what uh, I believe we need to see today, um, that, that in this larger picture, we see something above and beyond Daniel's faithfulness. Daniel is a good model of faithfulness, absolutely. We can learn a ton of things, but here's the reality. Daniel and his wisdom, which comes from God, <laughs> but Daniel, he doesn't save us. He's not the source of wisdom Daniel trusts in the giver of wisdom and he looks to that mysterious rock that shatters the empires of this world and so should we. Our hope is found in this strange rock that is not cut out by human hands that comes from heaven, that lands on this earth and establishes a right side up kingdom of love. This is Jesus and his kingdom and our hope is Christ a humble rock that is now growing throughout the world. His kingdom of love has, has grown from, from 12 unlikely apprentices some 2,000 years ago to 120 and beyond to millions across this globe. The rock that conquered the dark empires of this world is still conquering them subversively through laying our lives down for the good of other people. Wisdom is found in giving our allegiance to him and finding our joy in him. The letter of Colossians tells us that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And in another letter by Paul, 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 1.24, it says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, and in verse 30 of that same chapter of 1 Corinthians, it tells us Christ Jesus became to us 
wisdom from God. Now think of the irony of this. This is, this is crazy. There's one verse that I, I kind of hinted at. Let's go back to it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 11. Do you remember this verse? Here's what the wise men say to the king. They say this. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. This explodes with irony and meaning once we see that this whole thing points to Jesus, the rock that has come, the stone, the rejected one. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is God in the flesh. They're saying we don't have wisdom because the gods don't dwell with us and Jesus, the Son of God, comes and dwells with us as the wisdom of God. So wisdom, where are you? There, in the flesh of Christ, God with us. Wisdom, where are you? There, crucified and bleeding on the cross that we deserve. There, in the humble servant king, Jesus, the wisdom of love that overcomes evil through good. Jesus is our wisdom. And for through him, we have a righted relationship with God, restoration with our creator and our redeemer. Because remember, wisdom in its ultimate sense is not simply learning something, but it's loving and trusting someone who leads us in the way. Wisdom is found in and flows through a right relationship with God in loving and trusting this who. He grants us skill in living, insight, and knowledge in ways similar to what we see in Daniel. So you could say wisdom is spirit-empowered skill in the living that leads to flourishing. Wisdom is spirit-empowered skill in, in um, living that leads to flourishing. So my friends, Daniel teaches us that Union with God is the source, the means, and the goal of all wisdom. And in dire, disastrous, disorienting, and disheartening times such as these, we are called to turn to the rock. Seek him in scripture. Turn to his words of promise and feed on his truth. Fill your head and your heart with his words of truth. It is a wise use of the time, a wise use of your attentions to give your thoughts to meditating on God's word. Meditate on his word far more than Fox, MSNBC, CNN, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is that consumes your time. Flip it. Let his word consume your time and nourish your soul. And in confidence, go to him in prayer. He will grant the wisdom we need. It is true, you know. It's so true what the book of James says in the New Testament. He speaks to those who are suffering and he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith. Let him ask in trust of this good God. Wisdom, where are you? Where are you? Our weary world cries in desperation. Our our souls ache and cry out, Wisdom, where are you? Here I am. Here I am, says Christ. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Humble yourselves, and I will untrouble your dreams and I will give you eternal life. Lord Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. You are our hope. You are wisdom embodied, and you share yourself with us, giving us wisdom through your Spirit. And so, Father, in these days of groaning and creaking and aching, when there's so much blood shed on the streets and so many difficulties all the way around from natural disasters to the disasters we create by our own evil, give us wisdom to love one another well that your kingdom of love would grow throughout this world 
and a new Eden would be reestablished. And that order would overcome chaos. It's in the name of Christ, our King, that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Heath, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning or afternoon or evening or middle of the night whenever you are watching this. Uh, We're glad you joined us for worship today. And my name is Dane. I am one of the pastors here. And did you know that God actually has a rich emotional life? That God has emotions. He's not controlled by his emotions like we are, uh, but his dominant emotions, his emotional life is ruled by, characterized by love, by joy, and by peace. And we have Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. Dr. David Ekman calls love, joy, and peace the emotions of heaven. And we have the life of heaven dwelling inside us through Jesus. And so it truly is possible and really expected that we should grow in love and compassion in resilient joy and in peace, in assurance of God's love and grace toward us. And so David Ekman, who is a beloved member of our church, a scholar and one of our supported missionaries, uh, will be leading us in a webinar tomorrow, so Monday, August 31st uh, at 7 o'clock, leading us in a webinar on managing our emotions, which includes those negative and painful emotions that many of us have probably been experiencing a great deal lately. And this uh, webinar is one of the sessions from the Head to Heart class that he uh, teaches. And it's a wonderful class that we've been having at our church for many years. This year it's starting September 17th. And it could be a great time if you haven't already, or if you have before and want to do so again, um, to invest in your spiritual life and do it with your community group, do it with your spouse. Um, And I pray it would be very helpful to you in growing in love and in joy and in peace. So if you want a snapshot of that, a taste of that, or if you can't join for the whole class, I really encourage you to join us tomorrow night, seven o'clock. You can uh, find out the Zoom link for that and the other details on the website. So we hope to see you there. And with that, I'll send you out with a blessing. May the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with your spirits. Go in peace.